Spirit of Grace Church. Happy Mother's Day. That concludes my Mother's Day message. We'll move on to the next one now. Um, if you don't mind, uh, just bow your heads and let's just pray together really quick before we get started. Thank you, Father, for this day and for this opportunity to come and worship you and to learn more about you and to be enlightened in things that can help us to become more and more like you. Help us to follow you, help us to know you, and help us to love you even more not just for what you've done for us, but what you're doing for us and what you're going to do for us. Help us to respond to that love with love of our own. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. I'm going to be um, talking out of Luke in chapter 7. Starting at verse 36. And while you're turning there, um, a week or two ago, um, for, th for those of you that don't know, my official job title is, is called an ATP. That stands for Assistive Technology Professional. Basically, that means that I'm an expert, or I'm supposed to be, on everything related to um, keeping people with disabilities mobile or, or helping them to do things that they would not otherwise be able to do through the means of equipment, assistive technology. I refer to myself as the wheelchair guy, right? I was just talking to Katie about this yesterday. It's, that I got to be careful or I'm going to forget what I actually am and I'm just going to become the wheelchair guy because that's how I introduce myself because nobody knows what an ATP is. So I have to explain it to them just like I did to you. Um, but a couple, a couple of weeks ago, I was going to um, an evaluation in, at, at, a, at a hospital system that has multiple locations. And um, I had an appointment set up for, I believe it was for for 1 o'clock p.m. And I, I, sh I, I, I work out on my lunch breaks. That's when I exercise because it's the only time that I can do that, really, realistically. And so I, I have enough time. So I go to the gym. I do my lunch. And I kind of show up in the parking lot. And it's like it's like 12.52. So I, like, you know, like, quick, like, wolf down some food. And I'm like, okay, it's I have a couple more minutes. So I'm, like, peeling my orange, you know. I'm, like kind of doing the thing. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll walk in there like two minutes before the appointment starts. Because they usually don't walk out to get me out of the therapy waiting area until like right at the appointment time. And I walk in and it's like 12.58. And I'm like, hi, my name's, I'm Paul. I'm here for so-and-so's one o'clock appointment. And she's like, wait a minute, for who? I was like, oh, it's for so-and-so. She's like, oh, they're, they're at the other location. Can you can I can we do they need to reschedule or are they here or they whatever just tell them I'll be there as soon as I can, I'll be there as soon as I can, so I end up racing from the city that I was in to the city where I needed to be, which is about a thirty minute drive. So I thought that I was early, you know, five minutes early is right on time, you know. I thought that I was early, that I had enough time to sit there and goof around in the parking lot, peeling an orange, eating my lunch, you know, like. And it turns out that I was in the completely wrong place. As I was driving what should have been a 30 minute drive and considerably less than 30 minutes, I may or may not have exceeded the speed limit during this drive. I was rounding a corner, and I, I, I live and work about 55 minutes north of here. So it's not, the roads are not like your roads. They're very curvy. They're not very straight. We go around hills. We don't go through them. As I was driving quicker than I should have, I was rounding this corner, and my vehicle was leaning like this. It's not that scary, don't worry. But from the opposite direction, a law enforcement officer was driving the other way, and he didn't stop me. He didn't give me a ticket. He just looked at me, seeing that my truck was, you know, several degrees from upright, and went like this. Slow down. 
because he could tell. He didn't need the, sp the speed gun, you know, he didn't need the speed trap gun to tell that I was going too fast. I want to help you slow down today. I don't know if you felt like you've been in the wrong place. I get the sense, this overwhelming sense that somebody has been in the wrong place. And I want to tell you to slow down. John 7, starting at verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. That's nice. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And that in and of itself is kind of surprising because if you've read the New Testament, you kind of know. You're like, these two groups, like the Jesus group, like the everybody that likes Jesus and the Pharisee group, which is everybody that's like really enjoys rules. They're kind of at odds. So Jesus went to his, own, his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman, I'm reading out of the NLT, verse 37, when a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume, and then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Slow down. Slow down. You know, it's, it's when we read things like this, it's so easy to just go too fast and to just be rounding the corner with your truck, leaning a few degrees out of straight. Slow down. This woman is known by the fact that she's immoral. And people, we as people, you, me, everyone, we label people based on what we see of them. That's what we do. Oh, it's Paul. He's the wheelchair guy. Right? We, we label people based on what we see. Oh, he's a real jerk, that Paul, the wheelchair guy. Right? You, you, but you, you see what I'm, we, we base things off of what we see, off of our experiences with people. People knew that this woman lived an immoral life. And so they labeled her as such. She was immoral. Like, we know that's, that's what we know of her. That's what she's, that's it. That's her name, the immoral woman probably Mary, out of this gospel we don't know for sure, likely, but the immoral woman, we are known by others, we are known to others by the things that we do, and she's no different, and this Pharisee certainly sees her in that way, because he says to himself, seeing what she's doing, giving this expensive perfume to Jesus, weeping at his feet, wiping it with her hair, and he's like, Man, if he was really a prophet, he wouldn't let her do that. She's a, she's a sinner. The interesting thing about this woman isn't that she's immoral. Because ultimately everybody is. At some point or another, to varying degrees, we're all immoral. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we kind of all fall into that category. But the exciting thing to me, the interesting thing to me, the where we can relate to this woman, is that when everybody else just sees her as immoral, she comes to Jesus anyway regardless of her image. And the other people can say what they want. She's not worried about them. She's connecting with Jesus based on her need. 
her desire, her ointment, her perfume, her gift, what she has to give. She knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. She brings what she has, which I think is interesting and important. Because a lot of times we can read through things too quickly, slow down. We can read through too fast and not relate and not go, oh, gosh, I wonder what that, what actually happened at this scene. Because you have to think about this. If the pastor of a church was getting his feet wiped by the hair of an immoral woman, what would you say? Right? What would you say if you a known prostitute? right, was, was, was going to come up here and wipe somebody's feet with her hair and tears and use her expense, you would be like, ooh, doesn't Pastor know who she is? Doesn't Paul know who she is? Doesn't Randy know who she is? She's a sinner. Right? It kinda, and and it, it hurts to admit that, but it's, but it's true. That's what we do because we're, we're all very normal. Because we breeze by that first part so fast, and we just want to get to the part where we can look down on that Pharisee and say, oh, what a jerk. Pharisees are all jerks. They don't have the love of Christ in their heart like I do. Right? We do that because we're people. We're normal. This Pharisee is incredibly normal. He's entirely average. He's looking at it exactly the way that you or I would. Because we wouldn't want to see that. That's not what we expect. We don't want to see the teacher, right? We don't want to see our, that's my Jesus. Get your dirty hair off of him. Right? You're gross. Your sin, your past is too much. Get away from him. He's, the Pharisee's entirely normal. He treats it just like anybody else would. Because his whole life, he's been full of effort and trying and trying to, trying to do the thing for God, which we'll get into in a second. She brings what she has and not what she doesn't, which I think makes all the difference in the world if you're willing to sit there and just think about it for a second. She brings what she has and not what she doesn't. She does what she can, not what she can't. She can't make everybody think differently about her. It's, it's, we're past that point. That's water under the bridge. She can't change what anybody thinks about her. She's branded with that image to these people. But she comes and shows up and does what she can with what she has. She gives everything that she has to him. And I think a lot of times, and I know I say that all the times, right? A lot of times, a lot of times, a lot of times. I'm like a broken record. But oftentimes, is that better? Oftentimes, we get caught thinking, like, well, God only uses people like like Pastor Tim or like Paul or like anybody who's, like, willing to go up and, and use a microphone, or sing, or, or play an instrument, or really reads their Bible like every day. And they don't miss a day because they enjoy it every time. Even Leviticus. We think that. God's not asking you to bring something to the table that you don't have. Because who made you? He did. Who put the gifts that you have inside of you? He did. God's not asking something of you that you don't have. He just wants you to bring what you have. Do what you can with what he's given you. Bring your perfume, your ointment, your thing that he's given to you. You just bring your all and don't worry about mine. Because you're ca like Randy is capable of carrying weights that I could never carry, right? If we're going to do a deadlift competition, it's probably not going to be Randy. He's not going to win, okay? Right? And he knows that, right? 
But if, but if, but if there are, there are weights that Randy can move that I could never lift. Does that make sense to you? There are weights that Katie can move that I could never lift. Because there's a depth of compassion in her that I can never have. Because it's not the way God made me. He made me to make decisions and think quickly when times are hard. He made her to ponder deeply and think about things that, that I just, I can't. I'm not, I don't have the capacity because that's not the way God made me. He's not going to ask me to be the way Katie is. He's not going to ask her to be like me. That's why he put us together. And it's easy to see that in a marriage, right? But you need, to, you need to stop comparing yourself. Slow down. Slow down. Your truck is leaning. Slow down. God is only asking of you what he's given you in the first place. He doesn't want you to have my giftings or me to have your giftings or for you to do jobs that he's given to me or vice versa. Slow down. Slow down. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Can you imagine me doing that? I'd be like one of those boot brushes on the deck that some, you know, remember that your grandpa and grandma had because he was a farmer, going to brush the dirt off of it. It would never work with my hair. She wiped them off with her hair, and then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. This Pharisee is so entirely average, normal, completely normal. How many times have you invited Jesus into your house and said something just like that? Just like it. Just like it. Where you say, hey, Jesus, come on over to my house for dinner tonight. But, but, don't, but don't, let her, don't let that part of me wipe your feet with its hair. That's, that part of me is really embarrassing. You can't deal with that part of me, God. It's it's a little too big. It's a li- the sin is a little too too much. It's just too it's too much. You don't need to deal with that. You can't deal with that. Don't let that part of me just 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 ignore that, Jesus. Get get out of here. If you only knew, Jesus. If you only knew that I'm a sinner. slow down. Because the problem is, at least the problem with me, I can speak for myself freely without offending any of you. The problem is that I'm the Pharisee. I'm the one saying to God, no, 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 no. You can't deal with that. This is too big. God, how could you ever think to use me for that? God, how can you ask me to do this, that, or the other? How could you, how could you want me to witness to people? I don't even enjoy Leviticus. I've never read it all the way through. I can't even read Proverbs. I like Psalms. I'm a Psalms person. Psalms in the book of John. That's what I've got. I can't do Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Or we, We're the Pharisee. You're the Pharisee. I'm the Pharisee. You can't handle this, God. You can't handle that part, God. You can't use that part, God. Don't you, don't you know? Don't you know what that part of me is like? How could you possibly? That part of me is dirty. It's immoral. I have a past. Slow down. The reason that we're the Pharisee, this is, as, this is about as, I don't know, we're clo- we're, I'm getting emotional up here. It's dangerous. I just grabbed like 87 Kleenex out of this box on accident. We are 
just like this Pharisee. Because we love rules too. That's something that I say frequently when I'm teaching our college age people on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you know somebody, send them. We love rules too. And we end up thinking that, that unless we meet all of the qualifications, that God's not going to want to use me. I have to have it all together first. I can't be the immoral woman anymore. I've got to be the Pharisee. I've got to look the right way and act the right way and really like Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and have all the Mosaic laws and this and that and the other thing and dress the right way. And, and, and I have to know how to talk Bible talk and I've got to know all the Christian needs and I've got it right. That's not what Jesus is asking for. He just says, just bring the bottle of perfume, the one that, the one that you've got. We end up thinking higher of ourselves than we ought, which is so bizarre because it ends up making us believe less of ourselves than we should. We think of ourselves like we should be able to follow all the rules. And it ends up making us feel disqualified. I should be a better dad because I'm a Christian. I should be a better mom. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I <laughs> trying to work Mother's Day in a little bit. Um, I should be a better coworker. I should be better at attending church every time. I should be better at this. I should pray more. I should be a. You can only bring what God's given you. Operate in that, not in what someone else has. God will work those kinks out of you one, one at a time one at a time. Just bring what you can with what he's given you today, right now. Jesus said about the sparrows don't worry. The lilies of the lilies of the field, the flowers are not worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. They're worried about right now, today. And if I and if my father's going to take care of them, how much more is he going to take care of you? Don't be stressing about today or what you should be, your five year plan of how great a Christian you're going to be in five years because you're still going to be the same person. Just five years more wise. Bring what you can. Bring what you have. Bring your couple fish and five loaves of bread. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. I love this part. This is so good. This is like this is like so good. Because this is like, I can see this, right? I can picture this next, this next verse in my head. Because this is something that I've said to my kids many times. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Simon? I have something to say to you. Slow down. Slow down. It's very parental. It's very parental. It's not mean. Jesus doesn't just like, it doesn't say that, that <laughs> it doesn't say that he got out the scroll of Levit Leviticus and smacked him on the back of the head with it, rolled up, right? It doesn't say that. It's very parental. I can see myself saying this to one of my kids, Evelyn, right? I have something I want to say to you. Are you, look right here. Look at me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. We've had these conversations either with our kids or with our parents. Raise your hand if you were ever a child. Okay, so you qualify. So when Jesus says, look, look at me. Hook your peepers around this, right? When Jesus says, look at me, Simon, I have something I want to say to you. Slow down. 
Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. Verse 42, sorry. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. You know, um, relatively recently, a, a friend of, of Katie's and mine um, is, was really going through a rough phase of life and relationship issues. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna. I can't really say more than that without totally. It's nobody that goes to this church or any, on a regular basis or anything like that. I can't really say any more than that because I didn't ask permission. And and this person, significant other, was was treating her very poorly, and was kind of like spiraling back down the gutter that he had originally crawled out of. And I just was like so mad. I was just angry. Right, and I don't. I am not a. Like I pray, okay. Like I pray. I I tend to do more one-on-one -on -one communication. I would not say that I am like an intercessory prayer. Like that's not, that's just not me. Like I will. If Randy's like, hey, pray for me, or Tim is like, I want you to pray for this. I will. Of course, I will. But it's just not, like some people are just so gifted in that. Like, and again, it's like I reference my wife. It's like whatever gifts I don't have, she's got in spades and vice versa. Sarcasm is my spiritual gift number one. But, but I was so just upset. And I'm like, God, this is not fair. How could he do this to her? She's such a nice person. This isn't fair. How could he do that? Do you know what God said to me? He might as well have said, Simon, I have something I want to say to you. Slow down. God said to me, how do you think I feel when you speak to Katie the wrong way? And I'm not like verbally abusive or anything, but sometimes I'm so short. And what, a, why? Right? I'm like, I'm only 32 years old. I shouldn't be cantankerous yet. I can't. I'm, but that's what, that's, what, that's what God said to me. He's like, Paul, how do you think I feel when you mistreat, when you speak the wrong way? Right? Not like you're being mean, but I'm just like, I don't know. I just don't say things the nicest way all the time. That it's a gift that I've passed along to my children. Evelyn's really good at it too. She gets in trouble all the time. God's like, how do you think that makes me feel? Simon, slow down. Slow down. Your truck is leaning. Slow down. It's very parental. So Jesus tells this story about this guy who loans 50 pieces of silver to, to one person and 500 pieces to the other, and Simon kind of gets the message. He's like, well, I guess the one that probably has forgiven a lot more, like this lady right here, who has forgiven a lot more than I, you know. That's right, Jesus said. I can totally see myself having this conversation with my kids. Do you know what I mean? That's right. You, you got it. That's right. Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, right, slow down. Don't read past this too fast. He's not looking at Simon. He turned to the woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with tears and wiped them with her hair. Y 
you didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. You know, Pharisees, welcome to Pharisees Anonymous, first of all, fellow Pharisees. We, we, love the rules so much. We want to do so much for God. Like we love him so much that we want to just like do all the stuff and follow all the rules and be the best Christian that we can be. And we end up loving these rules so much, like I said, that we end up feeling disqualified because we value the rules so high. And rules are not bad, okay? I'm not saying they are. Is everybody clear on that? Do we all agree? Nod your head if you agree, okay? Blink twice if you're in trouble. I'm not saying the rules are bad. Jesus is not looking for perfect people. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Jesus is not looking for perfect people. It's not who he's interested in. Look at his, look at his choice of disciples so far. We got a bunch of people that smell like fish and tax collectors that everybody hates. He's not looking for qualified people. He's not looking for people that know all the rules already, that follow all the rules already. So why are you holding yourself to that standard when it's not one that God ever put on you in the first place? Especially not to do whatever he's called you to do. Because you can affect people in a way that I never can. Because I know how to come up here and do this at like a C minus to a B minus, depending on the day, like quality level. He's not looking for people who are qualified and know it all already. You can start doing now. You can start doing now with what God's given you already. There's giftings inside of you that he put there that have been there all along. Because the Bible says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. God's given you more than you can know what to do with already. You don't need to memorize Leviticus. You don't. You just don't. Or Numbers. Or Deuteronomy. First and Second Kings are really good, though. I'd recommend those. There's a lot of good stories there. That was a joke. You guys are awful. Whatever. (laughs) But we end up loving these rules so much that we end up feeling, okay, right? And this this is just something that happens over time. And I'm only here to remind you to slow down. Okay? I'm not... I'm not mad at you, certainly. God is definitely not mad at you. I'm just here to remind you to slow down. To slow down. We end up feeling like with all the stuff that we've done and all the programs we've been involved in and all the money that we've donated and all the church services that we've attended and everybody that we've told about the God, we end up feeling like we've kind of paid Jesus back. And you slowly go from this person who's, who owed 50 pieces and was forgiven, and you kind of like, over time sometimes, and you ha- God will catch you, okay? He'll remind you right, <laughs> he'll remind you and put you right back in the 50-piece camp. I'm here just to remind you to slow down so you can put yourself there. We slowly over time start thinking, well, I do so much, and, and I've done this, and I've done that, and, and Paul, I really don't need to hear the gospel today. That's like new Christian stuff. Give me a, give me a list of rules that's going to tell me how to be a better this or a better, right? 
give me five steps to being a better Christian or a more effective prayer warrior or a blah, blah, right? That's what we want to hear, Paul. Give me something out of the Old Testament that I've never read before. And we end up saying, well, I don't, I don't really need to hear the gospel. Like, I've heard that so many times. Is Paul ever going to come up here and talk about anything other than Jesus? No. If I ever come up here and don't mention the name Jesus once in one of my talks or sermons or lessons or whatever these are, you just run me down in the parking lot because it's time for me to go meet him, okay? Yeah, give me a chance, Randy. He's a fast driver. Slow down. But we end up kind of drifting that way, and not on purpose, right, with only good intentions. I'm not, I'm not here to beat you up. You guys are like, I thought this was a happy church. This was a nice church. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to remind you to slow down. I tell you. Verse 47, I tell you her sins, and there are many, have been forgiven. And there are many, have been forgiven. You know, she humbly gave everything she had in response. In response to love that was already there, she came wanting to do this thing for the for the for for Jesus. In response, it wasn't a reaction. It wasn't an overcorrection. Her car wasn't leaning on the highway like mine was because I was at the wrong place, right on time. Only to find out that I was 35 minutes late. She gave everything she had in response. And Jesus expected, expected nothing more than what she had to give. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The woman is forgiven totally, complete, completely, all the way. No reserve, no rules. He didn't say you're forgiven totally if you promise to sing on the church choir at least nine out of ten Sundays throughout the year. Right? We want 90%. There's, there's no qualification because our service Right? The reason that I'm up here with a microphone, the reason that I do what I do to get ready for this is because it's a response. It's an overflow of my relationship with Jesus Christ, the love that I have for him because of what he's done for me. It's a response. I don't feel obligated to be up here. It's a privilege, one that I try not to take too lightly. And I know that the worship team and your pastor and the drummers, because I'm one of them, and Owen and the all of our Sunday school teachers, it's a response. God's not expecting more of you than you have to give because what you give to him is a response to the love that he's already placed on you. You can't pay him back. No matter how many rules you follow, no matter how much of Leviticus you memorize, you can memorize Revelation too. I mean, if you're like really determined, no matter how much of it you memorize, no matter how many things you cross off the list, it's a response. Jesus wants a response. And there's a big difference between a response and a reaction. If one or, uh, you know, if one of us, heaven forbid, goes to the hospital and we need a medication and the doctor says, you, uh, sir, you're having a reaction to your medication. That's very different than you're responding to your, med you're, you're responding. It's responding. You're responding. It's a response, not a reaction. It's not a knee jerk. 
we're responding to the love that Jesus has already paid for it all, and we can never pay him back. So everything we do is just out of overflow. Because his love has poured so heavy, so deep, so much into you that it should just flow out of you, and you should just want to do these things. She's forgiven totally. Sorry, I got sidetracked for a second there. Sometimes I don't even know why I have notes. She's forgiven totally. Your debt. Because you have one. You had one. Is not too big. It's not. There should be no part of yourself where you say, don't. Don't get your hair off of Jesus. Don't, Jesus, if you only knew. There should be no part of you where you say that because he already knows. He already paid for it all. Totally. And Jesus does not go back on his word. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Slow down. Slow down. Let's stand. Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? He's the only one that can. He's the only one that can. And if you... Sorry, church, i got to follow what God's asking me to do. If you've been following the rules harder, more, deeper, then you've been following... Jesus Christ. It's time for you to slow down. Because Jesus wants you more than he wants a perfect person. That's why he called you in the first place. He didn't pick a perfect person. All throughout scripture in the New Testament, you can see Jesus ignoring perfect people all the time. People who are real good at rules. He'll get you from A to Z. He'll get you from where you start to where he needs you to finish. He doesn't want somebody else. He wants you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together today. We ask that this worship service.